Hello everyone, this is Dano from Dev Device, and today I have a special guest here on my little podcast. His name is Daniel Little, and he's the co-founder and CEO of Link My Box, which is an automation software which is awesome for Amazon sellers and other e-com store owners, as much as I know. So take over, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Um, yeah, so I'm Daniel, a co-founder and CEO of Link My Books. We effectively help e-commerce sellers to take the headache away from their bookkeeping by automating it using our software. Huh. Okay, that, that sounds good. That sounds like something I could have used back in the days when I was selling on Amazon. I just read a bit about your bio. You were an Amazon seller. You sold your Amazon business. Welcome to the club. Yeah, <laughs> I seem, did that twice, actually. I seem to talk to a lot of people who sold their Amazon business and started an agency stuff. So yeah, yeah we seem to be on the same boat here. Yeah, but, nice. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so what exactly was the headache that you were solving, that, that you experienced, that you solved with, with your current company? Yeah, so I think the benefit of being an Amazon seller and then being an Amazon software provider, or not just Amazon, but e-commerce software provider, is that you can personally feel the headache first. And that's exactly how Link My Books got started. So Pete and I, who own the company, we are both ex-Amazon sellers. And we had both felt the pain of going through various different accountants who didn't really understand e-commerce. They had like a handful of e-commerce clients, maybe two or three mm -hmm. And so they weren't true experts. And so it ended up being something that we had to learn ourselves in order to accurately account for our sales, fees, taxes, refunds, etc. And it is a complicated process. So we did feel the actual pain of that. And Pete is actually a software engineer by trade. So he actually came up with his own little tool that he used internally. And I will hold my hands up and say that I actually used one of our competitors when I was an Amazon seller, but I wasn't ever very happy with exactly how it worked. And so it was always niggling at the back of my mind, like we could probably build something better than this specifically mm -hmm. tailored to specific mm -hmm. markets to begin with. So we went after the UK market for Amazon sellers initially, mm -hmm. but now we've expanded out and we have sellers in US, UK, EU, Australia. We support Amazon, eBay, Etsy, Shopify, and we're just about to add in Walmart and TikTok shop. We support oh, yeah. Zero and QuickBooks. So there's lots of integrations between mm -hmm. anything you can be selling on and wherever you want to store that information. Mm -hmm. So when I sell on multiple uh, like Amazon marketplaces in different countries, and then I'm selling on other market like on Shopify or whatever, so I can just combine all these uh, channels into one and then link my books will tell me exactly what's happening in all these marketplaces and also help me with the taxing stuff, right? Yeah, so effectively how it works is every time you get a payout from one of these sales channels, so like Amazon, for example, you get a payout every 14 days. What we do is we then grab all of the transactions that made up that payout and we create a single summary entry which can be posted across to your bookkeeping system. So it'll end mm -hmm. up in your Zero or your QuickBooks account and that will mm -hmm. basically break down all the sales, refunds, fees and all the taxes wow. on all those items accurately mm -hmm. so that it mm -hmm. feeds nicely and automatically into your bookkeeping system mm -hmm. and inside your bookkeeping system is where you would then do your analysis of how much profit have you made and stuff like that. Uh, and that's where all your tax returns would be done. So we are effectively the middleman pulling the data from the sales channels, reformatting it, processing it, and then popping it into your bookkeeping system so that you mm. don't need to worry about that. Yeah. yeah, that sounds very useful. That sounds amazing. And you just built this thing from scratch uh, with a partner who used to be your Amazon competitor, I just read <laughs> in your about page. <laughs> so yeah. you guys used to compete on Amazon and then you became buddies and both like eh, sold your businesses on Amazon and, and ventured into the SaaS business. Yeah, exactly. So Pete used wow. to be one of my uh, competitors. So we both sold sports products, sports and fitness products. Um, um, it was one of, the, one of the niches we were in. And he sent me an email anonymously from like a random Gmail address one day saying like, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I'm one of your competitors, <laughs> but I don't have anything against That's, you. I have something against creepy. our other mutual competitor. And I'm um, sure you hate them as well. And so uh, I replied saying like, hmm, I can sort of work out who you are then. And so we ended up uh, having a chat and it just went uh, from there. Yeah. Like we became quite good friends, even though we were uh, competing on Amazon. 
was this other competitor selling from uh, from China? No, actually they weren't. No. They were also no. based in the UK. So Pete and I are both from the UK. Uh, interestingly, oh. I live in Sweden now and he lives in Australia. But mm -hmm. the other competitor was also a UK-based seller, oh, but they were just doing right. loads of black hat stuff and mm -hmm. like review manipulation. Oh, yeah. So we didn't mm -hmm. we didn't like them very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can relate to that. I, I mean, that's that's the one dark side of Amazon when people just you know do stuff which they get away with. Uh, even worse is when they start like manipulating your reviews. Yeah, because, you know they actually can. You know. Yeah, yeah, people, yeah. They will hire some, you know, people who will then just, just submit like uh, one star reviews for your listing. And we all know that, you know, to make up for one one star reviews, it takes like 10 five star reviews. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's one of the dark sides of what's going on there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I, I get that. But uh, today we want to talk about you, Daniel. We want to understand, we want to hear your story, man. So mm -hmm. what I typically suggest is to go back to 10-year-old Daniel yeah. and see what, what, what he was about. So where yeah. was he, what, what was he doing, and what was going on in his mind? So what, yeah. What, what, yeah. yeah so when I, if I go back to when I was about 10, um, I was living in Newcastle in the United mm. Kingdom. Um, I was in school, obviously. I think it was maybe when I was 11 or 12 that I started to get that feeling for entrepreneurial spirit. Um, like my mom was a, a salesperson. She was a, a medical representative, so she sold medicines to doctors. Uh, my dad was a, a software, a, an electrical engineer focusing on software, interestingly. Um, and so it was when I was maybe 11 or 12 that I decided that I was going to start an eBay business and I was going to, oh. yeah, I was going to go down. That's early, man. That's yeah. early. Yeah, yeah. So I when started I was, when I was fourteen. I thought I was yeah. early, but you are you're eleven years old already. <laughs> yeah. So I I always wanted to make money. I knew that I wanted to be like rich later in life, sort of thing. And so I knew that I had to start early. And so I went to we have a shop in England called Poundland, um, and that basically everything there costs one pound, um, which is about a dollar a dollar twenty dollar thirty. Um, and so I would always look out for items that I thought, you know, I could sell those for more on eBay. So it was sort of an early iteration of retail arbitrage, I guess. Yeah, retail but arbitrage. I didn't really, yeah. I, I spoke about this the other day on a different podcast and they said, so you did retail arbitrage? And I was like, hmm, yeah, I suppose I did. So yeah, <clears throat> I would go down to Poundland and I would find items. And I think one of the best things I ever got was like a little cappuccino frother. And it was basically like a little device. You put a battery in it <clears throat> and then you could like whiz up your coffee. And you could buy them for a pound in Poundland, and they were selling on eBay for like four ninety nine. So I would just go down, walk down to the shop, buy loads of carrier bags full of these cappuccino frothers, walk back up home, put them on eBay, and then like sell them. It was like I think my mom set the eBay account up because I couldn't do it because mm -hmm. I was under eighteen. So <clears throat> yeah, that was probably my first real taste of entrepreneurialism, and I think that I was hooked from that moment on. Like I loved it. I loved like the organization side of it, but I also loved like getting the sale and seeing the pounds come in, the, the, the money rolling in. So yeah, I was hooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember selling on eBay. I, I remember not liking the whole walking to the post office part and packaging and writing the address of the receiver, you know, and, and so the, the, yeah, the logistics part it kind of, <laughs> Well, I was not a big fan of that part, but yeah, but yeah I, I I understand. But yeah, and I also have a little bit of a eBay history, so yeah, I, I get it. I was quite lucky because uh, where I lived, I was maybe ten minutes from the big shopping center where I used to buy the stuff, and then at the end of my street, like literally a two or three minute walk, was a post box. And so back in the day on eBay, these items were really small, so I would just put them in a little oh. padded envelope and just stick a couple of stamps on them and put them in the post box. So I would stand mm -hmm. there for maybe five minutes, like posting letter after letter, <laughs> but it wasn't a very far journey to go. No. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you started with eBay and then, and so how, how long did you do the eBay stuff? To be honest, it wasn't very long. I think I maybe did it for like a year, a year and a half mm -hmm. max. Um, and then I think, I don't know. I think it just fizzled out. Like a lot, as with everything retail arbitrage these days, it was like, there was harder and harder to find products that made money. I think, Oh, that people start to realize that you could do the same sort of thing. So I think I sold the cappuccino frother for probably the longest period of time, like nine months or so. Oh. But then he also had like, occasionally they would have like a special offer where they'd bought in so much stock of a specific item and they would have that on like the end of a shelf. 
And I remember mm-hmm. one of the things that I bought was like a it was a Game Boy Advance case, and it was like a case and some game cases, and then like a little wrist strap, and that was a pound. And I think I sold them for like eight ninety nine on eBay, and I literally just bought the entire contents of the shop. So they had like about a <laughs> hundred in stock, and I just thought these are definitely going to sell. I'm going to buy them all. So I bought them all, but then once they're sold, like they don't get them back in. So I think it was mm. tricky after a while. Um, mm. yeah. And then I think I was like focusing on school as well. So obviously I was only 11 or 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so you went back to just being a schoolboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's not the, that's not the end of the journey because then I think I also remember that in school, I would go when I was walking to school at like the bigger school when I was like 12, 13 at this point. On the way to school, I would buy like a multi-pack of Coca-Cola or sprite or something like that in the shop mm. and then i would put it in my locker and then on break times and lunch time i would sell them for like five or ten pence less than what the school was selling them for so i would still make <laughs> money but then like they they were buying them for less than what they could buy them from the school so i think it was it was always there i was always like entrepreneurial trying to wow. make money everywhere oh uh, wow so that is really in your genes like ingrained yeah. like finding so, yeah. opportunities selling stuff so that was Incredible. And I mean, not many kids have this kind of mindset, but you yeah. seem to be like from early on, you wanted to find opportunities yeah. and, and you did. And, it, and yeah. it all worked for a while. And, and then from when, when one opportunity expired, you found the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I yeah. think when I was a little bit older, so when I was starting to get towards 15, 16, in England, you have this thing called <clears throat> work experience where you can go and like try out doing a job sort of thing. So when I was 15, my school was arranging that and I went to work at an accountant's because that's what I, I thought I wanted to be, an accountant when I was older. Like I liked counting money and stuff like that. So I thought it would be the best. <laughs> <of all. laughs> um, and I went and did work experience for them. And then they thought I was such a good worker that they invited me to come back and do like a summer job when I was just turning 16. So I went back mm. and did some summer work for them. And I, I liked it, but I, I found it quite tedious. Like, I think, to be honest, looking back at it now, they gave me a lot of the tasks that were like just manual data entry, like take this written notes from this customer and type them into this spreadsheet in the various mm-hmm. different boxes. And that was boring, really. Mm-hmm. Like, that, yeah. that gave me the wrong I, I impression of what being an accountant would be. So I think that mm-hmm. sort of put me off being an accountant. But Mm. it's funny now because now I've done sort of the full cycle and now I'm back into a software which helps with accounting and bookkeeping. And that's really where I started off in life. Like I wanted to do (laughs) that. So yeah, I've come the full circle now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So you were in accounting back in the days. You didn't like it. And now you're back in accounting kind of. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, But then there was a middle part, right? So There was a middle part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you go to study? Did you go like uh, university or something? Or what, what was your first thing after, you know, they released you from your yeah. school duties? Yeah, once I was released from school. So when I was, I had went to school till I was 18. Um, I didn't go to university at that point. I decided that it just wasn't for me. Um, I really already had a part-time job by that point. I was working as a like a mobile phone salesperson in like a shopping center. And I was earning money as a salary, but I was also earning commission. And that really pushed me to be like a great salesperson. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And so me being quite naive at the time, I thought, you know, I don't need university. I can just continue at the mobile phone shop. I can make loads of money here. And also I could then be a manager or an area manager. And that was my sort of, that was what I was going to do. Um, and then when I was about 21, uh, I met my wife. And I met my wife on holiday in Gran Canaria, believe it or not. Started as a holiday romance, became more permanent. And she was from Sweden. So she was from Sweden. I was living in the UK. And so now that's the hint why you are in Sweden right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Followed my heart. (laughs) So (laughs) as part of that, when I was like 21, working in the mobile phone shop, um, and I was full time by this point, but then I met her and I decided that I was going to go and take like six months off from work and I was going to go and live in Sweden and sort of give a relationship a go with her and ended up not coming back. Basically, we stayed in Sweden oh. for like two, three years, quit my job, started working in like the equivalent mobile phone shop in Sweden, had to learn Swedish, of course. So went to, Oh yeah, I was about to ask you. Yeah, so yeah, Swedish went is to, not exactly easy to learn, right? No, it's uh, it's funny. I'm from Newcastle and a lot of the words in Geordie, which is our slang, 
are very similar to the words that are sort of in cool. Swedish. And the way okay. I think about it, this is really off topic now, but the way I think of it is that when the Vikings invaded England, <laughs> they actually invaded the Northeast. And that's where uh-huh. I lived in England. So I think a lot of their words sort of rubbed off in our slang. So there's lots of words that we say in Geordie slang that is very similar to real is words, true? Swedish. Yeah, 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 yeah. That... So... so they came and dumped off their words. <laughs> yeah, they stole all the women. Northern England. And all the and they just and left, left the there, language, they... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, okay, so going back to the story. So then I was living in Sweden. I went to Swedish school. I did a course called Swedish for Immigrants, and I did that for like six months. It was two hours every day, Monday to Friday for six months. It was really intense. It was free, provided by the government. And I basically learned Swedish in that six months, and now I'm pretty fluent. So Mm -hmm. in that time, I knew that I wanted to get a job. So I went and, like, handed my CV out to basically everywhere that I could think of, and nobody really wanted anything. So I ended up going to the exact store that I wanted to work in, which was, like, a big mobile phone shop that also sold computers and everything, electronics, basically. And I said, listen... I've just come over here. I'm a really good salesperson. I am learning Swedish currently. I'll come and work for you for free. And I just want to show you that I can do this and that it'll help me to pick up Swedish, but also I'll show you that I'm going to be one of your best salesperson people. We call Um, that the foot in the door offer, right? Yeah, yeah. So, (laughs) and for me, it was like, I knew it was going to work because as soon as they saw how good I was, it would would be a no-brainer for them. And that's exactly what happened. Like after a month, they were like, yep, yeah, okay, we'll take you on. You can come and work for us. And I think I started working part-time for them. Mm. And, and then after about two years in Sweden, uh, me and my wife got pregnant with our first child. And so we decided that in Sweden, you have this thing where you can be, when you have a child, you've got 450 days where the government will pay you like 80% of what you were earning at your job to be like off with your child sort of thing and you share them between Mm. you and your partner. So we saw that as a good opportunity to go and live in England for a while because we'd get paid from Sweden and we could go and live in England. And it was my mom's first grandchild. So here we are going back to England now. So now we go back to England and I got a job as my mom's company, actually. So she was a medical rep. She was selling medicines to doctors. So I went and did that. And we ended up staying in England for five years. And so I did that for about five years Um, towards the end of that. So now we're talking about how old am I then? I think I was 20, 25, 26. And that's when I started my uh, first Amazon business. So now we're sort of up to the the last part of the story, so to speak. How how did you, how did you learn about Amazon and about, you know, that there's such a thing as, because when I first heard about it, I think it was 2014, I heard about this thing that you can actually sell on Amazon as a private person. As uh, Because to, for me, it was like, yeah, there's Amazon, they're selling books. But yeah. I mean, I mean, that you can go and sell stuff on Amazon, that was something I had yeah. to learn. I mean, how, how did you come across this information? And that's so funny because that was the exact year that I started as well in 2014. And that's exactly the experience that I had. It was like (laughs) one of my friends um, who was also quite entrepreneurial from a young age, he was making like customized phone cases and he was selling them on eBay. And at the time when I was the medical rep, I was making good money, but it wasn't really like helping me with my like entrepreneurial side and like really wanted to sell things like it was just a very different role. So it was good money, but it wasn't like making me feel challenged. And so I said to him, like, if I wanted to start an eBay business now, like, what would you recommend? And he said, well, to be honest, I wouldn't recommend eBay. I would recommend Amazon. And I said exactly the same to him. I was like, well, Amazon, what do you mean? Like Amazon sells on Amazon. It's, it's their company, isn't it? And he was like, no, it's not. It's a, they sell, but there's also a third party marketplace. And so that was like a total eye opener for me. And I was like, mm, okay. And he was selling his cases on eBay and he was doing some on Amazon as well. But he said the customization side of things was just not quite as good on on Amazon at the time. But he said you should check out this thing called private label. And basically you buy products from China, you put your own label on, and then you basically sell them on Amazon and you make a, a profit. And he said you should have a look at that. And so I actually ended up researching that. And as part of that came across Amazing Seller Machine obviously one of the big courses back in the day. (laughs) I 
I you you did. also bought the course. Yeah, did you? Holy cow, this dude, we have a lot in common here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did Amazing Seller Machine Six. Which one did you do? Oh, I don't remember the number, but yeah, it was one of those, lah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they were they kept on upgrading every year, I think. But yeah. yes, it was. I think I started with four, if I'm not. All mistaken. right, okay, so maybe you were a little bit yeah. ahead. So I, I actually tried to do it myself initially, and it was going okay. Like I had one product. I remember I put the first order on a credit card and like I remember sending them in and getting them home first and checking them. I checked every single unit to make sure it was good. Obviously, you don't do that after a while. <laughs> but the first yeah. one, I thought, yeah, I'll check every single one. Sent them in to Amazon and they just started to trickle sell, like not really heavily sell. I did the usual things like got all my friends and family to buy them and leave reviews, which you could sort of do back in the day. Um, and did like some discounts through like just tell your friends about it and you can give them this 50% off discount. And I sort of started to get some sales. And then I started to do a little bit of Amazon sort of advertising and it just started to take off. Like it, the, the product started to really sell quite well. And then they started to move up the rankings. So I did sort of like the first launch I ever did was like a true organic launch and it went quite well. And so that like gave me the confidence that, okay, this is actually going to work. And like, I can actually make money from this. And so that first business I ran from 2014 to 2016 and I still just had one product, but I had like six variations of color. So it was actually in the swimming niche and I basically had six different color variations of that product. And mm -hmm. after two years decided to sell that business because the thing that was mm -hmm. holding me back from adding more and more products was cash flow. Like even though oh, we're yeah. making good money, like, you, you had enough money to be able to like buy more orders and to take a little bit of profit mm -hmm. out. But if you wanted to grow quickly and scale, you were going to need a lot more money. And I obviously had my job that I was earning good money from. So I didn't really need to take money out of the business, but I wanted to grow quicker. I wanted it to be that I could use this instead of my job and quit my job. And so mm -hmm. I sold that business for like low six figures and took that cash and then worked with a family friend who was a millionaire who he put some money in as well. And we basically launched 25 products over the next two years. And so that mm. was our mission was like, okay, this is proof of concept. It's worked. We've now got some cash. Let's aim to launch one product every couple of months. And I think we ended up basically bypassing that by the second year we're launching one every sort of three weeks. Um, mm. And so we had after another two years, so this was 2016 to 2018, we had 25 products that were all like really well selling. We're doing between 30 and 40,000 orders a month. Um, wow. And so the business was quite sizable by that point. And I decided that it was time to move on and sell. Like after four years of trading on Amazon and doing launch after launch after launch, it was starting to get a bit repetitive again and like a bit tedious. And <clears throat> you would worry that Amazon was going to suspend you for all sorts of things. And like your products were yeah. going to be listed and the competition out there. It was like, there was a lot of like unknown. And whilst the business was making mm. good money, we'd been reinvesting everything to try and add more products all the time. So yeah, yeah, we knew we were yeah. sitting on I a little gold mine that, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and so we but saw, you were we selling saw mainly in the US or, or on the UK? Yeah. Uh, so it was mainly in the UK, but then we did UK oh, and mainly. all of Europe. And then about 40% of our business came from the US. So 60% was oh. UK, Europe, and then 40% was mm. US. And we actually ended oh, up right. selling it to um, a couple of guys who had a big US store and then a really small presence in the UK. And because mm. we had the UK VAT registration plus six registrations in the pan EU region, they were going to use our business as sort of like the legal entity to drive their US into the mm. EU expansion. Mm -hmm. So it worked well because we had some products that we hadn't managed to launch in the US yet. We just we always did UK first. And so they were going to be able to expand those into their US shop and they would take all their US products and put them in our EU shop and it would just mm. become a bigger business together. And then mm. interestingly, two years later in 2020, they actually sold it to one of these like aggregators. And then that Brazil, aggregator... What? No, it wasn't. It was a different one called uh, Marketplace Heroes or Heroes, I think they're called. Ah, okay. And then they actually used Link My Books for my business. <laughs> so it came back in the door <laughs> and they, they got in touch and said, we've just um, we've just started, we've just took over, <clears throat> we've purchased a business that's using Link My Books. And we've got a couple of other businesses that we want to use Link My Books with. And I think that you were the founder of one of them. And I was like, 
really? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they told me the business there. I was like, oh, yeah. They said, you know what? We recognize you because I used to do like loads of, we had sporting products. So I did like loads of like educational videos and like packaging and stuff like that. And I was all over it. All my face was everywhere wow. on it. And so they wow. recognized me when they came to the link to my books website and they saw my face in like some of the sections there. They were like, this is the guy who started the business that we just bought. <laughs> So another full cycle. Circle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Small world. Amazing. <laughs> so your new business owner became your clients and then they brought some other clients because they were educators. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So That's now okay. they they use us for a lot of businesses, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, I can really relate to this notion of yours what you just mentioned that you know, selling on Amazon, there's always this Damocles sword dangling over your head. And they can just shut you down yeah. at any point in time. Yeah. And for a good or for a bad reason. And yeah. sometimes I don't even need a reason. I know. I mean, something like product uh, used, sold as new was, was, in my case, was the reason for them to shut me down for, for one month. Yeah. You know, and with the suspension where you don't know whether they're going to reinstate you or not. So yeah. that was interesting. And the sales tax thingy. But, but yeah, so you also felt the pressure to that this is, you know, if this is my livelihood and somebody can just flip the switch on this thing, that's not a good thing, right? Yeah. It feels like really weird. And, and I think this is the situation with when we rely on any of these giants, be it Amazon, Facebook, Google or whatever. Uh, I mean, nowadays yeah. I recommend any entrepreneur to not be completely dependent on one of these fellas because they can do whatever they want and they can just shut you down and but it's do quite it. tricky really like I, I think a lot of people do give that advice but a lot of the sellers that we've dealt with like eight thousand plus sellers now and they all have a really large presence on amazon like anyone who's selling online sells on amazon most of the time like there's there's a few people who just sell ebay and etsy and stuff like that but most people who have like a big online presence of sales a large percentage of that comes from their amazon side and yeah. I know that from personal experience, when I was selling on Amazon, we thought the same, like, don't put all your eggs in one basket, try and expand out. So we opened a Shopify store and we spent so much money and so much time and so much effort trying to make that work. And eventually we just decided that, you know what, we've been doing this now for probably a year. We tried it and we spent so much more on effort and marketing and stuff like that. And it still only accounted for like 5% of our sales. And it was like, mm. even if, we continue to do this and we get it up to say 20% of our sales. If we still lost Amazon overnight, the business fails anyway. And so yeah. it is yeah. tough because like, obviously <clears throat> the best would be like 30% here, 30% there, 30% there. Yeah, It's, just, yeah, it's yeah. really tricky to get yeah. to that point. Yeah. Okay, there's a thunderstorm coming in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a comment, you know, to what you just said. Yeah, it's tricky to get to that how you say this in English? Diversification? Diversification, yeah. Diversification, yeah. Sorry, I'm German. Uh, That's so, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what do you think is the problem here? I mean, I, I've, I also have, of course, from first-hand experience and from other customers we work with, we also have, we, we hear the story like, why, why is it so hard to grow your e-com store? Yeah. And I think the, the thing that I always think about is that Amazon is just so easy. Like, I know that it's getting harder and harder and I know you've got like squeezed margins and shipping is more expensive and there's so many more fees and stuff like that. But it's still a super easy, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's still a I super mean, easy route to market. Like you have a product, you put it up on Amazon, you can be selling that day. Like there's not many other places you could do that. Like you could potentially do it on eBay and you could do it on Etsy. But again, these are like marketplaces. Mm -hmm. If you really want to diversify, and you want to take yourself so that you are in control of your customer data, then you need your own website. But if you're yeah. going to do that, then you need to drive your own traffic. And obviously, Amazon and eBay and Etsy and them, they are like masters of traffic driving. So they are doing of all of giants, that for yeah. you. Exactly. And they take they take 15%. It's like for you mm -hmm. to promote the product and sell it for the same price, it's going to cost you way more than 15% in running ads. So... It's just, it's too easy, isn't it? It's people go for the easiest mm. route and the easiest route is always going to be through a marketplace. Mm. Uh, well, what, what I have to say about this is, I think the biggest challenge is if you have to sell to strangers. 
then yes, then you're competing with Amazon because Amazon yeah. has millions of people coming to them just because they want to buy. But if we manage to build an audience, if yeah. we manage to build a brand, if we have an email list, if we have a community, if we have people who come back to us, who know us, who trust us, yeah. then I think that's the point when, you know, the, the table are ch turning here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, I think this, and, and I think this is the, the big thing that e-com sellers need to master is, is, to, is to build their audience and to build their brand so people come to them because they know them and they trust them. Yeah. Um, and, if you think and about, but yeah, it, it depends. Of, yeah, sorry, it, but it really depends also on the niche of the product. I mean, if you're selling toilet paper, it's not that easy to you know become the brand you know first choice. But if you are self sell something a bit more complex, especially maybe something consumable, what people would like repeat bias, I think that's that's when you really have a standing chance to to build your audience outside of Amazon and become independent of these yeah. big guys. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think you look at the big guys like look at Mr. Beast, um, look at uh, Logan Paul and KSI who are doing Prime now. Like they built up their audience first, they built up their following first yeah. to hundreds of millions of people, and then yeah. whatever they say is good, people buy. So yeah. I think Mr. Beast is a really clever person under the surface. Like not <laughs> only is he good at creating content and engaging customers, but he's also a, a very shrewd like business person as well. Like he knows that in order to continue to grow his business and continue to draw in lots of revenue, he needs to diversify. So he's not just relying on YouTube ads. He's also mm. doing his own chocolate brand. He's also doing his own burger chain. Like ev everything is like diversification. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's, it comes to the same point, doesn't it? He's got the influence to be able to tell people like these are the best mm -hmm. chocolate bars out there. And then yeah. hundreds of millions of people will buy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it does. Yeah, it's it's about this community, and not everybody can be a Mr. Beast, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think we can be like a little beasties uh, in our specific niche and in our community and our environment, and we can. But it, it also requires for us to be passionate about what we do, right? I mean, yeah, you, you can only do this when when you really like. Your product. I mean, today I, I spoke to to a, to a guy who's selling supplements, uh, but he is he's really passionate about what he's doing. So he created this supplement for for himself basically because mm -hmm. he was feeling the need to get this stuff. And so for him, it's it's an it's very simple to sell this to people and to to be the you know the face of the brand and and mm -hmm. to be the ambassador. Uh, so I think that is a very important ingredient to this branding source to to be actually convinced and, and passionate about what we what we do uh, and so, so because that, that's the only way we can be credible and we can pr promote you know what, what what we're doing and we can get people to follow us yeah yeah no i agree and i think yeah. that's why I, I find it quite quite exciting to work within link my books now because i have been there as a seller and I've felt yeah. those pains. And so I can see mm. that like the more and more people that we help with this, the more and more people that realize that they've been getting their bookkeeping wrong and that now by using Link My Books, they're actually saving tax and it costs them less than if they were doing it themselves. That yeah. it's it's like a total no-brainer moment. And those are the, the 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 best feelings, I suppose, in as a salesperson is when you can take someone who thinks that they don't need something because they think they're doing it right. And then you show them that actually, if you did it this way, it would save you even more money, and it's not going to mm. cost you anything. Like it's yeah. a it's a great feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's I think. Yeah, I think. And yeah, I really appreciate that. So you, you're obviously doing, you know, something that you really feel and where you really, you know, that there's purpose in in what you do. And yeah. that's I guess that's why you're so successful because you feel the purpose behind it and. You teach people what they don't know, uh, and and then you, and then you have these. They have these aha moments, and 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 you improve other entrepreneurs' lives. So I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, that's. Oh. I think that's the best thing we can get out of what we do. Yeah, so yeah. I really the appreciate feel that. Good, a lot of feel good, feel good business, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Wow, man. So that has been a very interesting talk. We have covered yeah. some very unexpected topics here. <laughs> Um, one 
one last thing. What would you tell a 10-year-old Daniel today, or let's say like a 16-year-old who just, or 18 who just finished school and he wants to start his entrepreneurial journey? What would you tell a guy like this? What would be your best advice with all your experience from today? Yeah. Um, well, I think if you think about my journey and that I started as thinking that I wanted to do something with accounting and also really liked the sort of sales side and making money side of things. Eventually that transpired into the ideal role for me, like working as a soft head of a software company that makes good money, that has lots of customers, but is something to do with accounting. So I think that if you have a feeling when you're much younger that you want to be in a specific role, but it's just not quite exactly what you want, then just make that role because that's really the, the future of, of jobs, isn't it? Like a lot of people say that like most jobs are going to disappear. So you need to start a company. So why not start something doing something exactly what you love? And you know what they say, don't you? That if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's couldn't be more true for me. Like I genuinely look forward to Mondays I look forward to going into work. I love what I do. And so it doesn't feel like I'm doing a 50, 60 hour week. It just feels like I'm enjoying myself during the week. And then I get the weekends off. Yeah, man, that's the way. This is the way, as the Mandalorians say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, although this accounting thing was quite obscure in your early days, right? It was not, I mean, there was no such thing like you're building a company for, you know, e-com businesses to integrate. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't even such a thing, but the idea was there. And yeah. just by following the idea, the, the, the actual manifestation eventually came along. And I think yeah. that's a very, very interesting message yeah. to give to people who, who are, you know, looking for a way in the entrepreneurial journey. So it's maybe just follow this idea and then the surrounding and the actual manifestation will come along eventually. Yeah. It's like yeah. you say, isn't it? That's that when you're passionate about something, then you can build up a community and you can then easier sell that product to that community. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. for me, it is that the passion is I, I really like counting finances. I like sales. I like, I like e-commerce as a space in general. So I think that it all just comes together in the rule that I'm doing now. There you go. You're such a lucky boy, Daniel. <laughs> cool, man. So thank you so much for this interview. I think yeah. I learned a lot. And uh, those who watched this video until this point, congratulations. I think you learned a lot as well. Um, I hope we can stay in touch. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, all the best with your journey with Link My yeah. Books. And uh, all the best. Yeah, same to you. Thank you, Daniel.